Welcome back to Unlocked, guys. I'm so excited because I have Brittany Ruby Miller here with me today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited, y'all. Um, I met Brittany. I really, it was kind of crazy how you and my dad had been in discussions with each other. And then I had his phone when you sent that last message. And it was just like the most heartfelt, kindest message. And I think, what did I respond? Just like, Hi, this is Savannah. I've got my dad's phone. Never in a million years did I think I would have access to his phone. You were like, who is this chick texting my dad? <laughs> who is this crazy lady from Ohio? Which is just a wild story how we got to know each other. But um, I know. I don't even know. How did you start messaging? I was on vacation. I was in the Bahamas. <clears throat> and I told Caleb I was kind of like starting to scroll I think it was about Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I'm reading all these articles, this headline. And because I, I saw a few of the shows, I always told him, I'm like, man, this seems like such a godly family, like love, you know, the family nanny. I have a nanny also. <laughs> um, and she's so, a trip. and my nanny, she's not here anymore, but she was British. And so like, I just connected so much with that. But again, it wasn't like I had seen the show a yeah. ton. And, but I started reading this story and I'm like, um, I knew you guys kind of liked, came to the restaurants once in a while. Yeah. So that was the extent of maybe I, you know, we could connect or something, but I was more into what was going on with the story. And I just said to Caleb, I'm like, my heart goes out to this family. I just need to be left alone and I want to pray. And so he's like, um, okay, we're, <laughs> we're on vacation for a week with our family in the Bahamas. But I was doing a morning Bible study and I was just reading and I was looking at the ocean. I just started to kind of pray for you and pray for the what was going on with your family. And then like a week later, um, somebody sent me the, a picture of Chase at Ruby's and it was Stop. us magazine. It was like one, some of the tabloids, yeah. with, I think his fiance. And I was like, well, I'm taking that as a sign. So <laughs> I have a friend who is also in ministry. Um, I'm, I shouldn't say I'm in ministry, but I just love Jesus and you, to bring I a marketplace say, ministry to people. You have been in ministry for me, so I will take it. So anyways, I sent a message to Brian and said, hey, I think you know him. Can you connect us? And within five minutes, your dad called me. And I was sitting there listening to, you know, the whole story, uh, basically right there on vacation. And then I forgot on, I think it was the 17th, he was yeah. going. And I looked at my calendar. I was like, oh, I meant to send him like a prayer or something before. Yeah. And so I said, I don't know if you're there yet or who has your phone. And you responded right away and you had just dropped him off. Yeah. And you said it was the hardest day of your life. Yeah. And we just connected from there. It was, I think that has been the biggest blessing because during this time you see people who are true and authentic. And then you also see people who were maybe only ever on the bandwagon while they were benefiting from it. And during this time, I was like, I don't know why. I just felt such a connection to you whenever you had like messaged. I was like, okay, this is a God thing like the timing and the everything that had happened. And then it was funny because you invited me on this trip. That, Another like, crazy woman. I didn't you know on vacation. anyone <laughs> like, <laughs> inviting me on this random vacation. For all I know, you could have been like absolutely insane. Totally. I said, you should like watch my I am second video or like stalk me on Instagram. I promise I'm not super crazy <laughs> um, or fangirl, but yeah, I just, when you say I, I felt a connection, like I just felt a connection and, um, you know, my, my dad, um, we're in the restaurant business, but he, Who, okay. Before we move any <laughs> further, I do want to, you hate he being loves you. bragged on, you hate being bragged on, but y'all Brittany is the CEO of her family's company, which is Jeff Ruby culinary, correct? Mm -hmm. And they've got multiple restaurants. So I've read Brittany's book, the five star life, and it is absolutely amazing just hearing i listen to the audiobook back and forth between visiting mom and dad and it is you and chloe yes me and chloe chloe literally was sitting in the back seat and goes can we listen to that woman's book please <laughs> she said i have to hear what happens and then she was like does she have kids now and i'm like You're a yeah your future old. best friends chloe <laughs> hannah and grace yeah so you are the ceo of your family's company yes. and my dad's the founder you two hit it i off. love him so I invited Savannah on a business Christian retreat um, with a bunch of business peers. And I just said, hey, I just feel like you're supposed to come. And and I was going to be kind of putting on an event the following year. And I thought you would be your story is 
absolutely worthy of being told and being broadcast because I feel like there's so many people who, even listening to your podcast before I came on today, the piece, man, that like I'm going off on a tangent, but the part where you said, you know, nothing is that important. Like nothing is that like my issues are nothing compared to what you have. And it just puts so much perspective, mm -hmm. but you, you had a point where you're like, so whether or not you just like had a fight with your spouse or your parent, like go make amends. Yeah. Like it, you, it puts so much into perspective with what you're going through. And with my dad, he always, I always grew up watching like a couple of shows. It was, he's super into victims rights <laughs> major. So actually got thrown in prison for, um, the Peterson trial. Cause he just was like popping off. He was so pissed at this guy in, no. in, in the court case. Like he, like I grew up on forensic files, cold case files, like all the things. And that's just, you know, my dad's one of a kind, which is why you guys, I think connected. Cause you were able I to fish it back with him. Love him. I don't even think we had a normal <laughs> conversation. I think Not at we all. just like, no, <laughs> we're smart asses back to each other 24 seven. And it was yeah. just, and to, I don't know, I think watching it and watching you and your dad, it's literally like watching my dad and I. And I said at first, I was like, okay, I'm kind of jealous because yep. like I miss my dad yeah. and I miss this banter, but I also knew that God put you in my life mm. to kind of help fix where maybe I was missing, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And so seeing that and being on that trip with you guys and just getting to sit there and hear your story and talk to Kathy Lee and hear her story mm -hmm. and the amount of time that was invested in me is like, I cannot say thank you enough. It was the greatest experience. Mm. It really was. Well, back at you. I, you have an infectious personality. And it's, Caleb and I joke because I'm 40 and you're 25, but your life experiences and sitting and talking to you, it's like talking to another 40 year old. Mm -hmm. um, well, my best friend is 45. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> literally 45 <laughs> it's, you've you you've lived a different life and and now you're dealing with I mean I think your first text to me was a picture of you giving Chloe a bath like from normal 25 year old girl you know and it's just man my heart melts for you and breaks for you and but I just like you said felt connected and so then when we all got together and I just I am so big into community I'm like you're in Nashville I've mm -hmm. got great friends in Nashville that have and we go to the same church we found Which out is crazy because you were like do you have a good church if not <laughs> you should really try this church and I'm not going to say the name of the church only because I like want one little right place of peace they wouldn't and want you to either they wouldn't I know. care and that was the yeah. greatest thing was one of the ladies reached out to me and was like hey I just want you to know this is a safe place for you and oh. if you need anything please reach out to me but and mm -hmm. then Danny and his wife mm -hmm. Set were there yeah. and like I just met so many great people that live here in Nashville and now yeah. I'm like okay this is yeah. like gives me a good and Angie with I am second the best you know what she told me um because when you said you might come on this trip, and it's a three-day thing, we were just in Florida. It was around a bunch of um, business people who also share faith. And um, Angie said, "That's." I said, "Be praying for Savannah. She might come on this trip." And she said, "That's so weird. I've been. I feel connected." I'm like, "Well, you and everybody else in the world, apparently, <laughs> like that was my. I felt connected." And I said to you, "Do you feel like there's a lot of people who kind of come up to you and say, I just feel.'" so yeah. called to you because it's so many people I think who who are praying and mm -hmm. who are believing for and also I think kind of maybe reading the tea leaves and saying like is there more to this story that and that's I'm just a sub like a very um I'm definitely not a conspiracy theorist but I am just very <laughs> um curious about what is you know I do a lot of like kind of investigation before I believe something mm -hmm. before I form my well that's opinion. what I think we lack in today's day and age is the curiosity and to actually put in the work to do your right. own research versus, Hey, I'm going to believe everything that Fox news says or CNN says, or mm -hmm. like maybe take it all in mm -hmm. and then say, all right, I'm going to look for the details myself. Yeah. And people don't do that. Right. And so I just wanted to part. get to know you and hear the story from you. <laughs> and we have like, I it literally, like, I love you so much. I, I literally felt such I don't know. It was that trip came along at a time to where it was like, I don't want to go. I want to go. I don't want to yeah. go. And then I was like, you know what? 
it's good. Yeah. It's good for me. And I got to learn so much and mm-hmm. seeing you too. I mean, kind of going back. So I did, I read it too. I was so nervous about having you on my podcast because first off, I had just left an event y'all to where she said, <laughs> I absolutely hate podcast. And so I was like, okay. I said, is- I'd rather be uh, summoned for summoned for jury duty. Yeah, that is exactly what you said. <laughs> but I'll do yours, Savannah. Um, and so no. I think starting, because I did, I put, I wrote down notes. Okay. Just from the very beginning, I guess, of oh. your story. So you've talked about Caleb. You've mentioned mm-hmm. Caleb multiple times, but mm-hmm. no one knows who Caleb is at this point. So Caleb is my husband. Been married 15 years. We have four kids. But yeah, so a lot of my testimony, and that's what I spoke about at the event that Mm -hmm. we were at, was my testimony. And I share openly about our marriage. And and I said in the speech that I was giving um, that day was that, you know, I I think that there's a lot of misconceptions, people who just you know, get married and you think it's all going to be bliss. It's like, man, it is freaking hard work. And, and I will say my generation, I feel like, and it's not a knock on my generation. It's mm-hmm. just, everything is so disposable, everything and everyone. Yeah. And people look at, I feel like right now people look at marriage as like, okay, well, if it doesn't work out, I can get divorced. Right. Like, it's just, it's so yeah. nonchalant. Like a oh, divorce is just the answer. That's what yeah. I can do. And I was called the book, the faithful fight. I did five star life because I grew up in high end restaurants. And so five stars is what you strive for. Yeah. And I believe that God wants you to have a five star life. Doesn't matter what your circumstances are at all. It's like, whatever it is, you deserve a five star life. But the faithful fight was really like just fighting for this marriage, fighting for my family, fighting for future generations that would be impacted by this one decision mm-hmm. I had because of, you know, um, all of the situations that, that I discuss in the book, which is a lot of it is just infidelity. And I realized when I was walking through that, oh, man, there are a lot of people that deal with this. Mm-hmm. And like I shared up on stage that day, I said, if like my, my pastor's wife said, if she said, I've been through this too, which blew my mind that my pastor's <laughs> wife, and she speaks openly about it. And my mentor t- speaks very openly about it now, but um, if you him. can get through it, you will have the most rock solid marriage that you could ever ask for. And so though the first five years of my marriage were absolutely hell, the, the last 10 years, we still have issues, <laughs> yeah. but, but he's my best friend. And, and it's not that I would wish that upon anybody, but going through that, plus all the other kind of things that I, I discuss in the book. And so, but fighting, like you said, you know, we're in a generation where it's very quick to throw in the towel. That doesn't mean that things don't happen. Mm-hmm. And it's always going to work out. And I understand that, you know, I have friends right now. Um, I have my best friend and I know your family is friends with Joel Osteen yeah. and there's Joel Osteen has a, I forget where I, I think I heard it on one of his sermons or I read it in his book, but just because God's plan A doesn't work out, that doesn't mean God's plan B can't be incredible. And my best friend is living like her best plan B ever. Right. I love that. So it's God's redemption. It's Romans eight twenty eight that he's going to use all things for the good for those are, who are called according to his purpose. And yeah. So what's that mean? It's like you're tapping into like, what is this purpose? And, and it, are we truly surrendering mm-hmm. to trying to live the life that we're proud of? Then, and I say this to you too, you know, Savannah, with your family, there is absolutely going to be a Romans eight twenty eight in yeah. your life and in your parents' lives. And with, you know, your sibling's life, it's just, um, um, you know, it, it's just sometimes, unfortunately, I was telling your makeup artist this right before we came on. God bless her. She's amazing, by she's the way. She's an angel. <laughs> but she's just like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. There's going to be a great moment. The thing that's really hard is the blink of an eye to God sometimes comes off as years and it feels like eternity to us. Yeah. Um, but I think through your email that your dad even sent you, like he's starting to understand, like there's a kingdom purpose for what's happening here. Without a doubt. And that's the thing. It's just like even visiting him. Like I said, I've never felt the presence of Jesus more than I have in that visiting room. And to be able to say that it's like a wow moment. I've been in the presence of Joel Osteen. I've Mm -hmm. been in the presence of all these great churches and all these, and not to knock any of those people. Right. I absolutely love Joel with yeah. like my whole heart and he's going to officiate my wedding. Aww. He, you know, he's absolutely amazing. But to be able to say that I've never felt the presence of yeah. Jesus more than I did in a prison visiting room says a lot. And to just see my dad, like I will say it's really weird seeing him 
with gray hair. Like, really <laughs> weird. Didn't have anyone. It's already gray? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, he's definitely used some color over the years. And now seeing him with gray hair, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, this is really See, I think weird. My dad looks better with gray hair. Oh, I love it. Your dad like, is like big pimpin'. Like, he is hilarious. <laughs> His outfits too crack me up because oh, they're one of a so kind. loud. They're yeah. so it's amazing. Yeah, but like even visiting my dad, like I know I have mm-hmm. so much hope and so much restored strength, and I'm like, this isn't the end. Right, and I know that they're going through what they're going through for us to make a difference, for us to make a change, for because whether let's whether this appeal works or not, they're still coming out with a story, yeah. and just for me and the things that I'm learning, which it's kind of funny because it kind of correlates to your story as well with when COVID hit and the PPP loans and your business potentially going under because of everything that was happening. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you started to educate yourself more on politics and how we make a change and how we make a difference. And I find myself doing that now with my parents. And it's like, I'm doing my research and I find where you know, my mom's in a facility that has no air, but yet they're service dogs for the prison that are in a heated and cooled building because it's inhumane for them not to have air. And I read an executive order that Biden signed that said all federal inmates must be housed in environmentally friendly facilities. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, okay, well, this is completely opposite of that. Right. And so now you I'm learn having, really quick, don't you? You do. You learn really quick. And that's what I said was there was once someone came at me and was like, I love how you're now talking about how corrupt the system is. And I was like, you don't know until you've been Mm -mm. impacted by it. So it's it's, real to you. Yeah, it is. It is your life. Yeah. And the part where you your dad in that letter said, this is our new legacy. I mean, Mm -hmm. if anyone reads that the email or listens to the podcast where you share it, like there is no way that that is fake. Yeah, his heart um in that for you Mm -hmm. and what you're creating and when i stepped into politics um was because you know we furloughed 625 employees overnight our revenue fell to zero um it was like what the hell do i do right now i'm a ceo of a family business my dad was you know was 72 i think at the time and said this is the saddest day of my career because he started this business in the 50s starts it he's like i have never experienced anything like this like what do you do And, um, but you, I always tell people like, I always let the politics to my dad. He was always the supporter. And I was more of like the one that kind of would be the buffer Mm -hmm. because he was so into politics. And I'm like, (laughs) where I shared my six step apology about his tweet, you know, he tweeted (laughs) something and I'm like, he, he tweets something out. Um, which I don't think his Twitter is existing any longer. (laughs) It does. You still got, it's. I couldn't find him. I was searching at the for real the Jeff Ruby, unless something happened. But no, he's got to be on that. But yeah, his Twitter's like he's got a hot mic all the time. <laughs> so I was really mad. He tweeted something out. I had to apologize to him because I was the way I handled it, which is actually it's the funny thing. Same thing happened today. You know, he did something and I just blew him up. Text his feelings are hurt. And my brother Brandon's like, Brittany, I love you. Are you open to feedback? Yes, I am. <laughs> OK, what is it? Um, when you're frustrated, you might just not want to shoot a text off. I'm like, God, I know this is like 101. I know I'm not supposed to do this. Yeah. I'm going to apologize. But he always handled politics and, and I just kind of kept my, my head down and then COVID hits and it's like, it's time to step up. Yeah. And I had no idea like who the senators were, who the key players were. I ha- actually, I believe the con- you know, Congress has more kind of influence into what's going on than, especially for us, um, then than the president and, and that's what matters like it actually does matter at the state and federal level exactly who is leading and that's why it's so important to understand kind of what's happening but i had said to you i'm like i got a quick study really fast <laughs> I, fast. I did not know a lot i still don't know a lot and, mm-hmm. and sometimes i think that that makes the best politicians right you mm-hmm. just do it out of your heart and that's where i see for you you are it's like through osmosis you're learning all of this yeah. and there is not a better education that you could have and so your dad's point about living a legacy and what that's going to do unfortunately you know the sacrifices right now both of your parents have a combined 19, 19 years in prison um 
there will be the Romans 828. There mm-hmm. absolutely will be that moment, but it's going to be, it's you're in the, for the long haul. Yeah. And you know that for sure. And I think too, the biggest thing is like, I've always said, it doesn't matter. Democrat, Republican, right. All that matters yeah. is the end goal yep. and about doing right by people. There are some Democrats that have some great policies. There are some Republicans yep. that have some great policies. Right. So it's not even about yeah. being on one side or the other. It's about being able to respect and understand the difference in right and wrong. Right. And that's what we were talking about. Like, you know, I, I went on CNN and the next day I was on Fox News and then I was on Bill Hemmer and then I was on the Today Show just trying to fight, for, like, get this we need the restaurant industry to survive. Like I just felt so strongly. I don't care. I am not left or right. Like I call it the radical middle, right? Because mm-hmm. and- please explain, because I think that's a big thing that people don't understand how badly COVID affected restaurants yeah. and small businesses. And I mean, a hundred thousand restaurants will never reopen their doors. And the restaurant industry is like the second largest, you know, in, uh, workforce in America next to um, the airline mm-hmm. uh, industry. And so when you, when you, re- I, and I, I kind of wrote this, like restaurant, restaurateurs or restaurant operators, um, when you, we should have been deemed essential. I still feel that way. We're 51% of the food supply chain in America and second largest workforce why are we being shut down? But, oh, that we're asked, though, that we should still have carry out. Well, carry out, th- that business is, you have to keep a machine running. Like, yeah. It just wasn't, it wasn't, it, that's not the way to do it. And so we just started really forming a group and through the Ohio Restaurant Association who took a great, great stance under the National Restaurant Association, um, started just kind of grassroots lobbying and and speaking to senators about how important this PPP was, but, but there was an expiration on, on the PPP and it ended up being a lifeline. But this eight week kind of forgiveness period, restaurants weren't open. And so we were about to like not have any of it. And it came down to Senator Johnson getting on the phone with him and uh, said, we really need you to sign off on this. Uh, if you don't, restaurants will be completely like th- th- we won't have any yeah. you have to sign off and during um i share this is in chapter 20 which i told you it was 2020 chapter 20 yeah which um, is weird he he just basically said uh well his lead advisor said just give me a minute um put us on hold came back and said senator just signed off it'll hit the press tomorrow and ppp was granted and it kept it kept hundreds of thousands of restaurants in business. Well, see, and that's what I love is the fact that you do have politicians who are willing to listen and who are willing to do the right thing. And you know, it was cool about that because this is what, that's one of the senators I think that you're going to connect with was- Well, because I sent you an article that was on Forbes and I really want to go back to it because- It just, I've been doing my research. Like literally I say that it's like a for dummies thing, you know, like you start from the beginning and you're like, okay, who are these people? What do they do? What can I do to make a difference? Not to get all parental, but it's time that we had the talk, you know, the one about the three letter word, the ends in X. No, not that one. Come on. I'm talking about a tux. And when you need a tux, the best place to go to get one is the black tux. The black tux makes it super easy to get on trend, top quality, guaranteed to fit tux without ever leaving your house. Here's how it works. Take the black tux fit quiz, pick the style you want to rock and boom, your tux is delivered to your door 10 days before the day you need it. That's plenty of time to try it on and make sure it wears you well. And hey, if the fit's not quite right, say hello to the black tux fit guarantee. Order a better size within a day or two of receiving the less than great fitting one and they'll send another right away at no extra cost. If you'd prefer an in-store experience, the Black Tux has showrooms across the country. Their expert fit specialist will help you find the perfect style tux or suit and make sure it fits you just right. The Black Tux experience has been absolutely amazing for me. I mean, when it comes to Grayson and making sure he's ready for these school dances, I wish I would have had the Black Tux sooner because it is way more affordable, super easy, shows up at the door, and definitely saves a few trips to the store. So when it comes to a tux, you can rent or buy. The Black Tux is the best place to go when you need a tuxedo for a wedding or special night. 
And right now, when you go to the blacktux.com slash unlocked and use code unlocked, you'll save 10%. That's T-H-E-B-L-A-C-K-T-U-X dot com slash unlocked. The blacktux.com slash unlocked code unlocked. So there was an article that Forbes posted and it was the Bureau of Prisons failure to communicate the First Step Act. And the First Step Act is a huge, huge act for incarcerated citizens. And it's about kind of rehabilitation, giving classes in order to, you know, have early release, things of this nature. And Senator Johnson was part of that article because this whole article talks about the Bureau of Prisons director, Colette Peters, which, you know, she is over the entire Bureau of Prisons. And as a woman in power, you have the capabilities of implementing so much change. Um, but also the hearing that was had on this was focused on the corruption and abuses at USP Atlanta. And one of the people that testified was Senator Johnson, and he had described it as a, he described the Bureau of Prisons in a way to where people have not been held accountable mm -hmm. and to where you have all of these people who are hired to do their jobs within the BOP that don't know how to mm -hmm. and don't have the proper education. And now people such as the director are not being held accountable for making sure that their workforce is in fact capable yeah. of performing their job. And for that, I read that and I was like, I have so much respect right. for yeah. that because it's like, if it wasn't for people like him, we would, right. you know, we would make no progress. Yeah. And when he was, when he was holding up the PPP, the advisors told us the reason why is because he really wants to understand mm -hmm. all of the legalese behind it and redline. And we just said, listen, like go back and redline it afterwards. Like it, if this doesn't get passed and he just kind of took it as a restaurant operators, uh, it, like kind of our, our personal, you know, experience. Uh, and so I understand he was wanting to be thorough, but I thought what was cool, nobody could get a hold of this guy. It, it, the restaurant association, like no one could, this is the one that we need. And so then when they, when, um, the Ohio restaurant association called me, you know, John Barker's the CEO, president and CEO. And he said, do you think you guys could write a letter? Like, you know, so my dad wrote a letter and sent the email. I was on the governor's task force in Ohio to reopen restaurants safely. Sure. And so I, we had a connection through an email, just, can I just, you know, um, to uh, Husted, I said, can I just get the email and we're going to send, you know, actually I called his wife, Tina Husted. And <laughs> I love you. And she gave it to me and she's like, it's like some senate.gov or something. Very, very, you could probably find it online. <laughs> yeah. But my dad wrote the email about what it's like to live the American dream. And, you know, he went from, he, his story is he had no father growing up, a coach he wanted to make proud. He ended up going from failing to getting a full ride scholarship to Cornell University and then came out and worked for hotels and um, and then said, I'm going to just get my own restaurant. And two of the Cincinnati Reds backed him, Pete, Pete Rose and Johnny Bench, That's amazing. because he couldn't get a bank loan. Um, prime interest rate was like through the roof and the bank wouldn't loan him the money. And so he just put that all in an email and said, I'd just really like to get on a call. And um, that afternoon, the chief of staff called and said, let's get on a let's get on a call. And then by the end of the night, it was passed that is promise that there are people who will fight for you mm -hmm. and who will listen. And that for me was when I realized, wow, it actually, they do want to hear real live stories. Yeah. And when we shared a lot of it, most of the time it was very positive. Wow. Okay. Thank you. And it gave me a lot of hope into what our system, you know, yeah. how influential one the Congress is and also how important it is to get on the phone pick up and, and support, right. And mm -hmm. to listen and, and to vote for people who you believe actually care. Yeah. And you and I have both seen firsthand how you have people like Senator Johnson, then you have other people who are just like all about the money and all about, I'm just going to keep quiet and I'm not going to ruffle feathers. And I'm, yeah. you know, there's, they're on both sides and yeah. it's sad. Yeah. And it's just, I think what yeah. you did with the restaurant business as a whole is absolutely amazing because mm -hmm. what you did didn't just impact your family it impacted 
all mm. these small businesses and restaurants and well, we, we need restaurants. We do. We do. <laughs> we need and Jeff Ruby's is one of my favorites. <laughs> it's the only one. And you're going to laugh because it's the only one. My dad like never went out to eat. Like he just, uh, since being on TV mm-hmm. and people, and I think it just gave him so much anxiety that he was like, I just want to be in the comfort of my own home. Sure. Yeah. And going to Jeff Ruby's, sitting back in the back room having them anytime they saw her name on the reservation they like make the sweet tea just then (laughs) because they know how he likes it like it was stuff like that that makes your business so successful and it was funny because we were listening to your book on the way down to visit dad my grandmother was in the car with me my grandmother was like i love her like she hustled she did everything (laughs) like she just never took no for an answer yeah because you started off Mm. you were like a hostess Mm -hmm. and you like you didn't just get the title of ceo overnight no i started (laughs) at 15 and my dad's like you're not working as a hostess in the restaurant that's too young and so i went up behind his back and went to our gm and didn't tell him that my dad said no yeah so charlie hired me and the first time my dad knew that i was working in our restaurant which is glitz and glam and the nightlife and I don't think I'd have my 15 year old daughter probably working in it now. No, especially too. Like you walk into Jeff Ruby's yeah. here in Nashville and it's like a jazz bar. It's like, awesome though. It's so fun. It's amazing. It's 15, so much maybe fun. Not. No, at 15, so, I like think of the people that frequent there and I'm like, he, I don't know if I'd want my 15 year old daughter. He didn't. And so he didn't know until he came down and was like, what's she doing hostessing? Charlie's like, what do you mean? I hired her. She did a great interview. And no. And at that point, it was kind of like, I think they probably needed a hostess. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there I was and um, just kind of grew up, you know, I was in the operations for 15 years. And and then when I thought when I graduated college, I was like, now I'm going to put on my power suit. I'm ready to go to corporate. And yeah. like, let's let's go. Let's expand this thing. Let's just I've got a college and, degree. I can do this. Yeah, it's my turn. And he's like, you haven't served yet. You did every other position. And so instead of putting on a power suit, I put on a server uniform and did that for a couple of years, which was like the greatest experience that I could have in the operations. Um, I think every human being should have to serve yeah. at one point in their life. In their life. I, hey, my dad did it for a hot second at the Cheesecake Factory out in Marina Del Rey. That's a Del good Rey. organization. I know it gets sometimes a bad, bad rap, but... <laughs> out in Marina they Del They run a Rey good operation. At the Cheesecake Factory. And he said it lasted all love like a few days until <laughs> someone was extremely rude and he like... Oh, he quit? He quit. He didn't stick it out? No, he didn't stick it out. Oh. oh. See, it would come in handy for him right I'm pretty now. Sure He's he threw, dealing with a lot of these. Oh. I know. I'm pretty sure he threw water in someone's face. Oh, my so gosh. So he was, you know, oh, say he God. was done with that. But I, I will say, like, in reading your book, there was one thing I read that gave me, like, I, automa- I already had so much respect for you. But when I listened to you say what I'm about to repeat, it just gave me so much hope and like the world and humanity and that there are good businesses out here that actually support people. You said it's important. Well, first off, it was you were talking about mental health and addiction and how it's so it's very prevalent in the restaurant business, yeah. how people struggle with that. Mm-hmm. And you want to make sure that the people that work for you have the time, money, resources Mm -hmm. that they need in order to get the help that they need. And you said it's important for our people to know that they work for a family that cares about them and is willing to help forgive and fight for them. And that was such, I was in such awe by that because Mm. like I said, we live in a day Mm -hmm. and age where everyone's so disposable. Yeah. And I just know, I know from just your business and going into the restaurant, it's like, the same people it's the same servers it's the same like there's not a lot of turnover in there (laughs) we love our people and that's why it makes me um i i didn't totally forget what i wrote in my book um (laughs) yeah yeah i mentioned some some stuff like oh god did i I put that i wrote about that (laughs) a different story yeah um I grew up and went to so many funerals for suicide and drug overdose Mm -hmm. as a kid And it's not that my parents would like say, come on, we're going to this funeral. Unfortunately, it was people that I really had connected with at the restaurants that, you know, they're just not here anymore. They did this or this or whatever. And I'm like, this is um, something so near and dear to my heart. Um, And even with Caleb, 
um, when he confessed. Yeah, he, I do want to touch on he, that because that it's, it's, you it was and, tough. And you sent me a text, and you were like, "Oh God, please don't hate Caleb." After reading chapters, Lance like, that always says that she's like, every time I hear this story. I get so mad at Caleb, but then by the end, I always forgive him. <laughs> and literally, your story is such a story mm. of redemption. And um, it's something, honestly, that really like put me in my place when reading your story, because you know how it is with how mm. close you are with your father and the things that he's probably told you growing up. I know mm. for me, it was just like, if a man cheats on you, you're done. Like, yeah. you don't go back. You don't like... And there's yeah. a sense of weakness that is associated with staying. Right, right. And that's just the stigma that's with it. When in reality, after listening and hearing mm -hmm. your story, it is the complete opposite. Like it takes so much strength yeah. and so much. Yeah. You have to have a like supernatural strength in order to you stay. Do. That's exactly what it is. It's supernatural strength. You also have to have a spouse who is willing to repent. And so That's there's the a, thing. there's a difference, right? To me at least. And so Caleb was ready to turn his life around mm -hmm. and therefore I was able to forgive him. And so I, I don't share an experience where there's just, um, defiance. Or... Yeah. At some point, you know, that would be really hard. Caleb I knew was at rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And so, and too, he played in the NFL. He had a career yeah. ending injury. And I know from dating someone right. in professional sports, when their career ends, They're their lost. life ends. Totally lost. You it's, see, yeah. It's literally like a death. Right. right. And it's mourning the loss of a life you thought you were going to have mm -hmm. that it's all they knew. Yeah. So it's an identity crisis. And that's really when things started falling apart. What's interesting, what, and I didn't, I don't think I put this in the book, but I'll when, tell Caleb you you had his, when Caleb had his back injury, um, he was in Seattle, he was tackling Sean Alexander, um, and a fullback kind of came and fell and he bent backwards. So like his feet ended up at his head and then somebody crunched him. So oh. he was like backwards bent and he was paralyzed for a period of time where he couldn't feel anything. And I was watching it on TV. We had just gotten married. Um, and so, well, you said you were watching and then it automatically cut to, goes commercial, to commercial break and no update on whether or not this, Ooh, Ooh, gosh, we're going to cut to commercial and like no idea what, how he was. So he later told me, I ended up getting a hold of one of the, somebody on the team, like the traveling secretary. And mm -hmm. they're like, Caleb's able to walk I'm like, great, good. Yeah. That's awesome. And when he came home, uh, complete devastation, but he, he, said his body was paralyzed for um, for like 30 seconds. And then all of a sudden a warmth came over his body and he was able to walk off the field. Mm -hmm. What he shared with me later, and this is kind of in that really crazy, when I say like the mental illness thing is real, he wasn't suicidal, but he just didn't want to live. So I think, you know, if you're, and this is something I've learned through therapy, that even if you're thinking, you know, would it be so bad if I just drove, if somebody hit me in a car, like, that's still the gas tank is empty. Yeah. Right. You are very close to being at a point where you can do something. Mm -hmm. And if Caleb was in that position, like, and I'm, I'm also going back to the people who every time I hear about a suicide, it just, I, you're crushed. You're absolutely crushed because there's a way to get help. And so that's why with our employees, we, you know, um, we are very, very, probably too much overkill involved in how are you doing personally? Like yeah. I'm, my employees probably get sick of me. Like, no, really what's going on? You know, like I work for a restaurant CEO, not a therapist, <laughs> you know, but I don't care because I've been to enough of these where if, if something seems off, I know at this point yeah. something is probably off. And so we support whatever that therapy might look like. Um, but Caleb had actually said, get ready for a lot of job applications after oh, this good. interview. We're still in a labor crisis. So yeah, jeffreby.com. <laughs> but what Caleb said that day, that one infuriated me. But then I thought, man, this is really crazy. The power of your words. He actually said the night before he prayed to God that God would just put him on the IR for the rest of the year. Mm. I just don't want to live life. Um, he's living in this insane, you know, sin. He doesn't want to do life anymore. Again, not suicidal, but he was just over his situation he was dealing with. And the next day, there you go. And he's wiped out for the rest of his career. And uh, wow. now Romans eight twenty eight, he wasn't in a position to be playing football because of what was happening up here. 
uh, mental illness and what was going on. So he had to figure that all out. And that took a few years to figure mm -hmm. that out. There's a great place. I, I told you about this called the Meyer Clinic in Dallas. And I was about to go there. Man, you literally took it out of my mouth. It's amazing. Like, People have to hear about this. It really is. There's nothing like it. Um, and you went, well, there's, there's other great places. I went to onsite. I've okay. talked about it. You're like, right. you oh, see, well, I respect that. You were trying to respect what I had said. <laughs> I've, I've heard great about, things about onsite. Yeah, I've spoken about onsite. I love it. It was a game changer for me in my life. But where it differs from the Myers Clinic, from what you've shared mm -hmm. with me, is it doesn't have that Christian yeah. element to it. Yeah. Which in someone who is very strong yeah. in their faith, that Christian element is a... Yeah, I think it's so. It's a big thing. I think it's just like an added bonus. Because yeah. the other, the flip side is that you don't want to go to... Um, a Christian place that doesn't have top-notch doctors. Yeah. Or, because, you know, I always say when you find a therapist, it's like interviewing an employee. That's It's got to be a fit. Mm -hmm. And if you've never been through therapy before and you get a bad therapist or you get something that's not qualified, you just give up. Yeah. So the good news is with the Meyer Clinic, it's psychiatric care. So mm -hmm. you've got counselors, psychologists, and psychiatrists. Because... Um, there's a medicine component when your brain is off, you know, and this is my, this is my own personal belief. I understand that some Christians probably think you don't need medicine and you can pray through it. Well, what I learned at the Meyer clinic is no, your, your serotonin genuinely dips, right. Mm -hmm. And you need something to kind of kick you back up. And then it's like, yes, then you have the ability to be able to use all these life school skills and tools and things that you would need to deal with it. And then they also couple that with how that relates to the Bible. And, you know, when you look in Psalms and you look at how depressed David was, he's like crying mm -hmm. out, you know, for Paul, um, looking at all of, you know, Philippians and, and reading what he wrote while he was in prison. Right. So you go through, it's kind of nice. You're reading scripture yeah. and re being able to relate to these stories while you're also getting really great therapy, but you're actually not like you don't check in. So it was a eight to four type of thing. Caleb went for well, he told me he was going for three weeks and the doctors are like, this guy's, we got our work cut out. We need six <laughs> weeks with him. And I'm like, what? Six weeks? Are you serious? thought he was going to come back and it was going to be like, kumbaya, everything was good. It was not. And then they said, well, you need to check in too once he came home. And I'm like, I'm not the one with the problem. You know, he is. Yeah. And I realized down there, well, I had just dealt with a miscarriage. We had a neural tube defect. We had an eptopic pregnancy. Um, we had infidelity in our marriage. We, he had a career ending back injury. I'm building my career. You were hit then by I a drunk driver. Got hit by the drunk driver, was total crazy lady that wouldn't allow anybody, to, including Caleb, to drive my children. I know that sounds crazy. It was like, no, <laughs> no one's driving my kids unless it's on like a small little road. Yeah. So then and, now my kids were suffering. I had to move. Mm -hmm. I, and two, it was just crazy times. What One thing you spoke about in your book was your dad... Yeah. And the potential loss of him. Right. When you were a child. Yeah. And he was first a, memory I have at, at all of a kid. And a that kid. your childhood years, you know, were the right. most influential when the most growth happens and yeah. development. And you had that fear. Yeah. I mean, he was in a coma for how long? He was in a coma for a month. Yeah. He was declared brain dead. So my dad and my mom got in a huge fight. My dad's kind of just like, eh, we're cars going 30 miles an hour. They are in a car. You know, it's like to fight with somebody in a car. It's like a, a hit the eject button, right? This well, he did. so bad. No, because it's after like, meeting him, now you get it. all I could envision. Is jumping out of a car? After I mean, meeting him and reading that, I was like, oh, Jeff would totally just like he try would to jump walk out of out. a car. Yeah, he, he's like, it was going 30 miles an hour. I was going back to work. I had my Reeboks on. Yeah. And he ended up at University Hospital for a month. And... Um, Priest came in with my mom there, read his last rites. Um, she did have a prayer line set up of like 5,000 people that were praying for him nonstop, wow. nonstop. And he had another seizure while he was in a coma. And they said, we're, we can try this experimental you know, procedure. And that guy saved his life. He, can't, he snapped out of it. Um, my dad was always very smart growing up, uh, or I remember him growing up. You know, he was always very smart. But they said to my mom, what was Jeff's IQ before the car accident? And she's like, I don't know. I mean, you don't go to Cornell because you're stupid. Yeah. Right. But they said he's testing out at like genius level IQ. He's smarter than any doctor on this case. <laughs> and he was literally brain dead and had a 2% chance or 5% chance of living without being brain dead. And miraculously, he pulled through it. I mean, 
you, when you think about the power of prayer and like how much, can I like preach to you real fast? Yes. Because you're like, I heard you were talking about Chloe and not wanting to pray and like, I'm praying, yeah. I'm sick of praying. I've done all these things. Yeah. You know, it just, and I share this in the book, you go back to the parable. Cause I said the same thing. I'm done praying for a baby. I'm done. Like if God wants me to have a baby five years, whatever it was taking to have a baby. And Caleb just said to me, Caleb grew up in a Texas church and knows the Bible inside and out. And he's like, well, don't you know the parable of, you know, of the widow who pleaded her case to the judge? No, Caleb, I do not know that parable. Would you mind sharing it with me? He's like, she wore, she eventually, like it talks about how she eventually wore the judge out and the judge granted her request. And that is to say, your prayers matter. Like wear God out with your mm -hmm. prayers. Giving up praying is not the answer. And, and I think now when you, you know, this isn't like a, I'm not trying to like go on a preaching no, thing, but like I, we're in a freaking battle, yeah. right? What are our weapons? Mm -hmm. The weapons, all we have really is prayer. When things are out of your control, what else do you have? It's like, you can't give up prayer. So that's, yeah. that's what I would tell Chloe. Yeah. <laughs> tell you her literally. to get to that chapter. Yeah. Get to that chapter. I'll tell her. She, trust me. She's going to ask me, can we listen to that woman's book please now? And I was like, okay. No, that is so true. And it's so easy to give up on the prayer. But it's like you said, you never gave up throughout. And now you have the most so, gorgeous children. Yeah, we have three kids world. and I have my bonus uh, stepson who's 17. And even that story, so. y'all, okay, I know her story better than she knows it. I have read this book. I love it. It's the greatest thing He's ever. He's 17. He's 17. Six, when, nine. And I tell everybody he gets his good looks from his stepmom. Oh. <laughs> and he loves that. And so does his mom. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's the thing. Great it's, family relationship now, but it took a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. It's like reading your book. You've been through all these things. Like you have every reason to not have a relationship with God, I feel like. Mm. If you would have taken it and just been like, poor me, why me? But instead you took it and you were like, all right, I'm gonna grow from this. I'm gonna be better from this. And even whenever you met Caleb, mm -hmm. he had gotten her pregnant, correct? Mm -hmm. yep. And then- Before I met Caleb. Before you met him, yeah, before you met him. That would have been a whole nother layer. Oh but... God, that would have been, I know, we don't need it anymore. <laughs> so before you had met him, he yeah. had gotten this woman pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then y'all met and it was like an instant connection, clearly, because I've seen y'all and I'm like, it's absolutely amazing. He kind of tricked me a lot into becoming friends with him because <laughs> I had just gotten out of this relationship with an athlete and I'm like, never again. Girl, and then preach it. I know it happened. And he kept having our mutual friend who was the head coach of the Bengals, his assistant call me. And she kept saying, Caleb really wants to meet you. Like, weren't you a religious studies major? He's like a minister. He's going through a really hard time. You know, he, he was not, he did not like really, I mean, sleep with anybody before. Yeah. You know, it was like very religious type of person. Yeah. And then he got rocked in college and all of a sudden he's in the NFL and now he's got a child. And um, the good news is, you know, and they were best friends, you know, and, and we're all friends now, but. I didn't know what I was getting into necessarily. And Caleb mm -hmm. will tell you that. And again, you'll forgive Caleb by the end of the book, but he's going through, yeah, he's, he's going through a freaking mess and I wasn't interested. And I'm like, now I'm for sure not interested. And he's like, can you please just be my friend? I have no friends up here in Cincinnati and picked up the phone and stole it from Sandy and like put me on this guilt trip after she had been trying to set us up for a few yeah. weeks. And I'm like, not no. interested, not, she actually tricked me. She goes, Hey, ESPN wants to film at the restaurants. This is what she calls me. And they need to know, um, we're gonna, they're gonna do some story. And so, and I'm like talking to her about the story, which is believable. And then he just swipes the phone from her. I'm like, are you serious? Is, wait, is ESPN even really filming at the restaurant or not? Yeah. You know, and it was like, no, we just wanted to get you on the phone. So anyways, very crazy story. Enough for a book. Yeah, enough for a book. And everybody so, has a story for a book. And you guys went through, you talk about it in your book, how it was never the easiest thing in the world, going back and forth between mm -hmm. your stepson's mom yeah. and you and Caleb and all those we things. We were in some crazy love tri triangle. It was terrible. Yeah. When I realized it, by that time, I was already <laughs> knee deep into it. And I'm like, what is going on? So. And now, though, it's in such a healthy Communication place. is key. Communication Truth is key. Truth is key. Repenting and is key. I think where you learned that though, who I now am like low key obsessed with, and I'm having him come into my life oh. for oh, Taylor. Ford. Yeah. After hearing him speak and after yeah. hearing the things that you have said about him, I'm like, okay, I need him to sit down with my family. Um, I need him to sit down with the next person I date. I need, yeah. <laughs> like, I need him in every aspect of my life. 
I don't know anybody that does um, his approach to leadership training, family media, like mediation. Um, he has an ability to let everybody in the room feel pretty heard mm -hmm. and valued, which is important, especially with the mediator. Yeah. But, you know, he'll look right at me and I've got the relationship with him and be like, you are dead wrong, Brittany, you know, which makes my dad feel better or Brandon, you know, or Dylan or Caleb. And, um, and he's been through a lot, you know, he was a CEO of a couple hundred million dollar company and mm -hmm. blew it. Basically he blew it by all the same things that I'm talking about. And when he came into Caleb's life, Caleb was able to relate because he's like, listen, I've been here before and, um, and was able to walk Caleb through that. And so now we call him Papa Ford. And so even my kids call him now and say, well, I'm dealing with this, you know? Yeah. He's definitely got a, a mansion in heaven. And I'm like, dude, just, I'm like elf. You know, like it's Santa. I know it's him. Santa. Like, remember my name. <laughs> yes. Because one of the things you talked about in your book and you talked about previously was learning the sixth step. Yes. And you kind of touched on it with your dad's tweet, but you didn't go into detail. Um, on the tweet or how, how to six step somebody? How to six step someone. Yeah. So um, basically, a lot of times we will give very um deceptive or manipulative not genuine apologies to people yep. tone you said body language and tone of voice right that's a big piece that's why it's got to be in person because um you never that's one thing too that i thing. took it was like you never apologize over text no you it must be in person if it yes. can't be in person you don't do it over a phone call you do it over like facetime yes. or zoom or whatever right, right. and yeah. the six steps okay i'm just gonna i'm just gonna okay. say it six Go. steps number one is state the offense i'm sorry that i did this okay i whatever it is okay number two acknowledge you were wrong and i was wrong number three apologize i am very sorry Number four, ask for forgiveness. If and when you're ready, will you forgive me? Ooh. If and when you're ready. Otherwise. That's a hard one. You can't ask somebody to forgive on the spot. It's going to take some time for a few things. Number five, ask for accountability. Will you hold me accountable? And number six, ask if there is anything else. That's the kicker. And that's the, that is the only way I think to get transformational relationships with people. <clears throat> and for our family, that was the piece where we realized, okay, you can apologize. Mm -hmm. And we're in a family business. That's why I keep relating to the family yeah. piece of it. There's a lot of family businesses that struggle for this. Um, and especially when you bring spouses in and then you have grandkids. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And you know, it can be tough. And yes. there's something that they could be holding against you that happened five years ago, you know, mm -hmm. whether it was uh, 10 minutes ago or a decade ago. And that last question, is there anything else that I need to apologize for? Yeah. Brings everything else up and it will take some time <laughs> and get professional help mm -hmm. when you're ready to have that conversation. Because it like with one situation with, you know, my family, it was, we had to sit down and it was two, two or three hours to sort through. The, there was actually something much bigger than what happened, you know, through the apology yeah. process. However, once you have all of those conversations, like my best friend will tell you, I always know where I stand with Brittany because if I didn't, I know she'd come to me within 48 hours and tell me. Mm -hmm. I, I know through the apology process or Brandon and Dylan know like, no, she's not gossiping about me. I'm not part of the solution. So it's like you have 48 hours to go talk to that person with gossip. Same thing with the apology. It's like, I, she's not holding anything against me because we would have talked about it in the apology, you know? And, but by continuing to ask that question and go through that process, if something happens in the interim, right? You go back to, is there anything else that I need to apologize for? And that kind of goes back to something you said was if you don't confront, it kind of, it ties into what was it that you said when you were like giving your speech and you said, if you don't confront the issues now, it will continue for generations. Like what oh. was that that you stated? So we were talking about how a lot of times you'll see um, things, re history repeat itself within yeah. generations, mm -hmm. right? Like how many, how many times do you hear or see in your own family, like unless you bring that to light, mm -hmm. 
it continues to happen. So for Caleb and I, there's a lot of like, we are pretty bold and being open and transparent with our kids. Like they, yeah. and they're 10 and 12 and like, they've seen my I am second video, you know, which is amazing. Y'all, if you have not watched it, you have to listen to this. I am second video. It is amazing. It's a sweet website. Um, and, but I share this about my marriage and, and, but I also share this stuff about, you know, how Gracie came into the world and, and what a miracle that was. So, but they know I have a book out there and one day they're going to read it. If I were to hide everything that happened in our marriage, um, statistically, it's highly likely that my girls would go through that or my son would do what Caleb did. Like you have to cut it off and like that needs to die in a generation. Mm -hmm. And the only way to have that die in a generation is to be honest about it. And so now do I like bombard them with the details? No, they're still yeah. kids, but it's like, Hey, daddy really didn't behave the way he should have mommy forgave him. <laughs> right. Yeah. But then eventually as you get older, you, they have an appreciation for one marriage is tough work. Here's how, you know, all of the process and, and, and we go through that. But yeah, I believe like you can't, you can't conceal or hide, especially within families, um, deep, dark secrets. Does it mean you go and like air all of your dirty laundry? No. no. I don't think it does. Like, I don't believe in that. I don't think that you have to do that. I do believe in confession, but I don't think that you have to necessarily go to a church to confess. Yeah. You know, you can confess or talk confidential confidentially to whomever it might affect. But within a family, uh, a nuclear family or uh, your your immediate family, I should say, um, you, my opinion is you should not hide that because it's going to continue. It's eventually going to come out and yeah. it's eventually going to, you're going to reap the consequences for the constant hiding. Yes. And I feel like that teaches. Probably projecting a lot more than you think by yeah, hiding it. exactly. <laughs> it's like, let's just get this thing out. Exactly. And that's something that truly did help me. I went back to dad and I think I told him in an email exactly what you said that night. Because mm -hmm. that night I laid in bed and I like recounted like the whole day. And I was like, look, this is like, it was the greatest thing ever. I was no. like, her story is amazing. I was like, it's been the biggest blessing. And I stated that, and it's so true. If you don't confront yeah. the issues, then yeah, the ones behind you are going to have to confront them later on. Well, we've talked about God a lot, so if you want to cut this part out, cut this out. But biblically speaking, <laughs> the Bible says you will be cursed the second and third generation. See, that's what I was getting at. because So I'm trying to give yes. the stained glass version of it, or the plain glass yeah. version, because, but it is... Um, it also actually happens statistically too. And so, but if you look in, it's, it's in scripture, very clear that that would happen. See, I love that because that I'm telling you that weekend was insane for me. Mm. Just the things that you said, the things and to, before we end, cause I'm going to end it on a fun note, Okay. but also there was, I love these like six step, seven step, yeah. you know, and you touched on the seven steps for handling an upset person in a restaurant and that was yeah. yes and that <laughs> was my favorite thing because i'm like first step well you meet me with being upset i'm gonna meet you with being upset <laughs> that like yeah no. as much as you want to do that that typically yeah. doesn't work especially in a restaurant yeah <laughs> and what i love is the first number one remain silent two remain silent three remain silent four thank the person for the feedback Y'all, I would have lost it by now. Um, five, repeat back. And six, make a commitment to follow up. That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Like that, I was like, oh my gosh, no, I would have lost it by step one. And like, Remaining silent is tough for me too. It's very hard. <laughs> I have Ruby DNA, just like you've got that's the Chrisley DNA. That's what I say. DNA. I'm like, I've got Chrisley DNA. That's I'm tough. I'm going to lose it. But it's almost like you have to do that when a person is that upset my brother always make, makes fun of me. He's like, cause he'll just be like, when he knows I'm really pissed about something, yeah. just, just, can you just please just relax? When in the world has anybody told you to relax and you actually feel relaxed? No, me relax. Like, like chill out. Yeah. <laughs> like just, that doesn't happen. Right. So no. I was just going through a situation that has been very hurtful, um, honestly by Christians. I, I, I always, I apologize on behalf of Christians because I love that to me, like a lot of them can give Christians a bad name to yeah. me. It's like, there's freedom in, I hate religion and I love relationship. And I know we've talked a lot about oh, I love God that. on this podcast. I hate religion, hate love religion, love rel re relationship. But yeah, unfortunately, um, I've had this situation happen where I'm 
really upset about it. And I'm in a place now where I can, you know, but there's some people who like said some things. I'm like, how, wait, hold on. How are you a Christian? Are you, are we reading the mm-hmm. same Bible? And it is what it is. And so I've, I'm like in a better place through that process Ford, who you were talking about, um, coached me through how to handle some of the feedback. And it was, I was in a tough place with that remain silent, remain silent, remain silent. Mm-hmm. And also own your piece of whatever, like there's something that I could own in, yeah. in what happened. And so I did. And in that conversation with some, with these people, the first thing I did was apologize as much as it, I mean, it like went against everything <laughs> in my body. And now I'm looking, I'm like, man, I can hold my head up high on this situation. I know that I handled this where I'm walking away from it and I have no regrets. Mm-hmm. And so that apology right off the bat, or if you're dealing with somebody who's really upset, man, that remains silent. I always say it just gives you some time for your blood pressure to just like let the yeah. blood come to a simmer. Speak when you're angry, you'll make the greatest speech you'll ever regret. Is one of my oh, favorite, favorite again. quotes. Speak when you're angry, you'll make the greatest speech or give the greatest speech that you'll ever regret. That is And so I do that with my husband. So He's true. like, Why aren't you talking? I'm like, I don't want to have to apologize. I'm too stubborn to you. Yeah. Like and he'll keep poking the bear. Like these are like the little fights we have now, not the nuclear fights. Yeah. But like I just shut my mouth when I'm mad because mm-hmm. I don't want to have to be the one to apologize. You're a lot like me, I have a feeling. Yeah. And you I will wanna... convince you that I was right. <laughs> even like if I was wrong, even if I know I was wrong, I'm gonna, I'm gonna convince you I was right. Yeah, we need Savannah, I love you. We're gonna work on that with you. I used to be the same way. Now, you know, you said this the other day. Um, I think you said in your podcast you were speaking about how the government has wronged. Yeah. You and your family. And you were so humble and since you know what, I actually had to reflect. And not all are bad. Yes. There are people out there. So, I mean, that's huge. There's a lot of people who just aren't able to sit back and and be humble enough with themselves, humble themselves and get rid of the pride and get rid of the ego, right? To say, what is my piece in this, Mm -hmm. right? And one of my favorite things going back to the apology is I actually look forward to apologizing. Like I like when I, as a CEO, I have to apologize to an employee or I have to apologize to my family. It always 100% of the time, even the situation I just apologized for, I'm believing the goodness that comes out of that. It has always strengthened every relationship when you can find an opportunity to apologize to someone. I love that. And to it does, it allows for more growth and yep. tougher conversation and right. you don't always have to be right. That's that's the biggest thing. Well, I absolutely love you. And before love we you. end it, we're going to talk about Oh gosh. <laughs> the reality TV show oh. that you guys once were approached with. Yeah. That you spoke about in your book. You did talk about that. The networks are missing out. Hey, we should do like a Chrisley <laughs> Ruby, like oh, Nanny gosh. Faye and Jeff Ruby. Maybe for like an episode, but no, I always, I say this humbly if my dad's listening, but he's an HR nightmare. I tell him that all the time. <laughs> yeah. I've got a good thing going with the business. Like the fight, like the time it, that I spent with him, total HR nightmare. Total. total. And he does he knows he doesn't care, but um, no, and he, I want to say this, like he is an amazing human being and he is my best friend, like your dad. That's why I, I think we connected. also bonded and connected. Um, but yeah, so we had an opportunity to do some reality stuff and, and ended up not doing it and it's, <laughs> it's worked out okay Probably for us. for the better. <laughs> it's been okay. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, I'll just stick to like cooking on TV and food network stuff. See, that's great. Maybe that's you fun. and Julie can like do a thing yes. together whenever she comes out. I love that. We'll bring her to the restaurants. And... Hey, bring her to the restaurant. She's got some good like, you know, she prison should recipes be doing now. That while she's while she's in there, she should be writing as many recipes. Oh, she as is. She, can. she is. And the things that are made in there is mind boggling. Mind boggling. The creativity is at it's like, like chopped a thousand. prison style yeah Yeah, chopped prison style 100 (laughs) percent. the fact that you can joke about that i mean look at where you are and literally it's been a couple of weeks yeah it's just going to continue to get easier and better not easier you're you're going to have probably those moments of of sobbing and that's okay you have to do that Mm -hmm. you know um but i think too for me it's like i know in my heart like who my parents are and that's what brings me so much joy and in a way, I'm so blessed and grateful that 
all these other people get to experience the love of them. Yeah. That's like they're sweet. in there and they're with these people who are struggling with like my mom's the mom for those don't that haven't had a mom. My dad's the dad for those that haven't had a father figure. And so for me, I'm like, you know what? I'm blessed that they get to be that for someone. You're willing to share. Yeah. So I'm willing to share. Not for long now. Not for long. I'm still fighting. But thank you so much for coming on my podcast. I love you. I love you. for having me. It was better than jury duty. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) I was prepared too. I was very prepared. No, there is nothing worse than going on. And I'm the worst moderator. That's one of the things I needed to apologize for. I'm not, don't, do not sign me up to interview anyone. Yeah, trust me, I won't. I'm terrible. But there's nothing worse than going on a podcast or going on a show and like, so talk to me about your family business. I'm like, did you, did you come on, read? read the book? Like yeah. my, w- when my dad wrote a book, which it's also very good called Not Counting Tomorrow, he would just say, read the book. And so we were like, we're just going to get this dude a t-shirt that says, read the book. Read the book. Now I get it. It's like, read the book. <laughs> I love that. Well, guys, we've talked about this book club before. So oh. read Brittany's book. It's absolutely amazing. Mm. The Five Star Life. And you will love it. You will gain so much life and spiritual knowledge. It's amazing. We good? Th- that was amazing. You are good. You're- you should do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs>